research from Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York for her publications of original research. She has already proven to be an astounding addition with her superb surgical skills and highly rated patient satisfaction scores. Her interests lie in voiding dysfunction, vaginal and laparoscopic prolapse repair, fistulas, and mesh removal. Um, she is one of our West Side doctors that works out of Avon as well as Fairview and also has a clinic in Strongsville. Next, uh, Deborah is Okay. Uh, next, Dr. Raymond Bologna is also on the line. He is a urologist specialist from Akron, Ohio. He completed his urology residency at the Cleveland Clinic in Akron General and his female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery uh, fellowship in Philadelphia. He has been in practice for more than 20 years with interest in incontinence, vaginal and laparoscopic prolap repa prolapse repair. He is affiliated with medical facilities such as Akron General Medical Center and Medina Hospital. We also yeah. have Dr. Howard B. Goldman on the line. He is fellowship trained and board certified in a subspecialty of female medicine and reconstructive surgery. He's currently a professor on the faculty of the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine. His interests are in medical and surgical treatment of urinary incontinence and types of voiding dysfunction, neuromodulation, prolapse repair, and neurourology. He has authored over 250 articles and book chapters and has been a visiting professor in the United States and abroad. He has also been involved in the development of innovative techniques for the treatment of urinary incontinence and prolapse. He is at Hillcrest Hospital as well as downtown at our main campus, and he also goes to Beechwood and Twinsburg. Uh, lastly, we have on the line Dr. Sandeep Basavada. He serves as the urologic director for the Center of Female Urology and Reconstructive Pelvic Surgery at the Cleveland Clinic. And he has published numerous manuscripts, textbooks, and book chapters in the area of voiding dysfunction and urinary incontinence, and has been named top docs in Philadelphia and Cleveland magazines for the past several years. His main clinical interests lie in the area of urinary incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, and complex reconstruction of the lower urinary tract and management of complications from vaginal and lower urinary tract surgery. Dr. Sabada also currently serves as a president of the Society of Urodynamics, Female Pelvic Medicine, uh, and Urogenital Reconstruction. Dr. Sabada works out of Maine campus uh, as well as Strongsville and has clinics in Avon. So these are all of our doctors that you will be hearing from today, and I'm going to let them take over now. If you have any questions, please feel free um, to write them in the chat and we will address them at the end. All right, Sarah, thank you. So this is Howard Goldman. I'm gonna start things off and I decided since it was a nice day, I was actually going to sit outside and enjoy the weather. So that's why you see my fence behind me. All right, so what do we do as Sarah sort of introduced and as you can get from some of the background descriptions of the various physicians that are on the line. We deal a lot with incontinence, urinary leakage. We deal a lot with pelvic organ prolapse. So when the bladder, the uterus, other things are falling through the vagina. We also deal with problems with urination, people who have trouble urinating. Um, and our little group, given that we're sort of at a very specialized center, we also have a lot of experience with some more unique types of female pelvic reconstruction, things like fixing prior complications of surgery, things like fixing fistulas between the bladder and vagina, as well as um, other types like that. The most common things that we deal with really though are incontinence and loss of pelvic support. So some sort of vaginal wall prolapse. And this is a very common thing. If you look at the data, greater than one in three women experience some type of leakage of urine or some kind of prolapse. Now. In many cases, it may be mild, and many women who've had vaginal deliveries have a little bit of these things, but as I said, in many cases, it may be mild and may not to need to be treated. However, if it starts to bother someone, that's when we need to treat this. So how do these sorts of problems occur? So pregnancy, um, particularly vaginal childbirth, but just really going through labor in general um, and having going through a pregnancy, having that, that uh, heavy weight sort of on the pelvic floor, that can lead to these problems. Uh, patients who are constipated, who are straining, coughing, uh, people who are smokers who are coughing a lot, 
Uh, there are a lot of different things that can factor into this. People who have had a prior hysterectomy, some of the attachments to the vagina may not be as strong. And then it seems to sometimes run in families. Uh, so some people just are more predisposed to have this happen. Next slide, please. All right, so, well, what's normal? So the truth of the normal, the truth is that normal is different for everybody. So typically seven or eight times per day of urinating is considered uh, within typical, a typical number that uh, uh, the average person will urinate. But look, there are people who their entire life they've urinated three times, and now they're urinating six or seven times. And so for that individual, that would be, um, you know, perhaps if they're bothered by it, that would be overactive bladder. On the other hand, somebody who's had six cups of coffee a day and goes to the bathroom 10 times a day and doesn't mind it at all, well, then that's fine. That's, we're not gonna go ahead and, and work on that. Uh, but somewhere between seven and eight, up to seven and eight times a day is what most people will urinate. And most people uh, perhaps will get up once a night. Certainly as people get older, I frequently say that when people are in their 70s, they get up twice a night. When they're in their 80s, they get up three times a night. There are also things that can irritate the bladder as far as going off in things like caffeine, alcohol, um, and other types of, of things can sometimes cause bladder irritation. Next slide. And then there are different types of bladder control problems. So there's overactive bladder, where when you gotta go, you gotta run to get there and you may leak, or it may just be that you're running to the bathroom like uncontrollably all the time. And then there could be leakage with cough, sneeze, exercise. That's called stress incontinence. And then a lot of women may have both types of incontinence, sort of a crossover. So the way we figure this all out is a good history and a good physical exam. So seeing the doctor, the doctor asking the right question and doing a proper exam. Oftentimes we'll have patients fill out a little um, log of how often they're going, things like that. And on some occasions we may need to look in the bladder or do further testing. And of course, these are all for when this is a bothersome thing. Again, if you're going often, but it's just the way you are and you don't mind it, then that's great. Uh, but if not, then that's where we come in and try to figure out what's going on and offer some sort of treatment. I'm gonna hand it over to my partners and in the next few uh, slides, we're gonna talk about some of the uh, treatments. I'd be happy to take over from here. Thank you, Dr. Goldman. Uh, I'm Dr. Emily Slopnick, and thank you all for being here today and all the interest. Um, as you can see, this is a very common problem, so it affects a lot of us. So I will talk about overactive bladder specifically and urge incontinence or that leakage of urine associated with an uncontrollable urge, unable to make it to the bathroom on time, that gotta go, gotta go feeling, uh, which may happen at day or night. So in terms of treatments, we often refer to a treatment ladder or treatment algorithm, which is based on our urologic guidelines. And we start with those lifestyle or behavioral things that Dr. Goldman mentioned, evaluating what you're doing and the, your intake on a daily basis, what types of liquids you're drinking, um, other medical problems or medications that may be contributing, and little small changes we can make throughout your day that really can make a big difference. Uh, in terms of treatments outside of that, uh, as the first picture shows here is pelvic floor exercises. And many of us have heard of Kegel exercises, but learning to strengthen and coordinate the pelvic floor in order to Con one, control your bladder better and give you a little more time to get to the bathroom. And by doing a good pelvic floor squeeze, that can actually suppress that urgency. Especially if you're, sometimes you have this urgency incontinence because your bladder truly is full. And sometimes you have an out of control urge when the bladder is not full and the bladder is kind of wrongly giving you that sensation when there's not much in the bladder and doing a good pelvic floor squeeze can help suppress that. Um, we can give you information in the office and information to go home with to try to do this on your own. And I generally will describe, to know you're activating the right muscles is when you're urinating, try to stop the flow of urine, which is actually really hard to do. Um, but that's how you know you're activating the right muscles because a lot of people will end up 
it's squeezing kind of your glutes, your, your butt muscles. And it's really those muscles a little forward than that, that you control your urine stream. Um, we have a wonderful team of pelvic floor physical therapists through the, the Cleveland Clinic who are physical therapists who are specially trained in the pelvic floor that can really help you coordinate those muscles. Um, there are other patients who maybe have pelvic pain or have trouble emptying their bladder who we have to be careful with these exercises because you don't want to strengthen them too much. You can cause pain and the physical therapists, um, if you're open to it, are really wonderful. They examine you externally and internally and are very thorough. And in addition to helping you with the muscles can also help you with other control and day-to-day -day lifestyle kind of strategies. Um, also, pelvic floor physical therapy is a great treatment for both the urge incontinence as well as the cough, sneeze, sneeze laugh, stress incontinence. As you can tell, I think everybody could benefit from physical therapy, so it's often a great place to start. Um, that's all part of the first, what we call first line therapies. Second line therapies is trying medications. We have several medications that target the receptors and the muscles in your bladder to help it relax, to help relax that out of control squeezing and urgency. Um, there are two types of medications and sometimes we'll try a couple of them and it's a little bit of trial and error to figure out what's gonna work for you and not cause other side effects and decision on a medication is something a choice to between you and your physician looking at your other medical problems and your other medications to make sure there aren't any interactions and finally we have um, a few procedures that are considered third line therapy um, that insurance will cover most of the time if you are not responding to or have uh, side effects from the medications one is botox shots in the bladder so this is nice, it's done in the office. We put a small flexible camera in the bladder and give injections of Botox into the bladder wall, which again helps relax the muscle. Um, it's very low risk um, and it's, it is something that does wear off and we usually do it about every six months in the office. I think about it like going to the dentist, you get your teeth clean and you get your bladder Botox every six months. Um, the other two are more aimed at the nerve input to the bladder. So. The, what you see the picture here on the right is PTNS or posterior tibial nerve stimulation. So there's a little needle, essentially like an acupuncture needle that gets put in behind the ankle. It stimulates the posterior tibial nerve that provides actually feedback to the nerves that supply the bladder. Um, this is nice, there's, there's really almost zero risk to it. So some women will prefer to try this before anything more invasive. And we also have a really great um, nerve stimulator that we can implant in the back. We can do an in-office test at, that gives you a trial for a week, or we can do it in the operating room under sedation that, that provides kind of a nerve reset to the bladder. It's almost like a bladder pacemaker that can be very successful in a lot of people. Um, in the office, we can certainly talk about risks and benefits and, and personalize the treatment or approach to each of you, but that's kind of a, a basic overview. What do we have on the, the next slide? Is that moving on to stress incontinence? Oh, so here are a couple of pictures of what I was talking about. So the Botox uh, shots are on the left there. So we put a camera in the bladder and give those injections into the bladder wall. And the other two are showing the sacral neuromodulation or that nerve stimulator where um, we put a needle, essentially a needle into the back and that allows us to place a lead or a long wire that just floats along the nerve that supplies the bladder. And after that test, which can be done in the office or in the operating room, if it works well, we connect it to a battery, which is seen on the right. There are two types, rechargeable and not rechargeable, and that's just implanted right under the skin. Okay. Um, and then in terms of the stress incontinence, uh, I will pass it over to Dr. Basavada. Great. Thanks, uh, Dr. Slopnik, and thank you all for uh, being here this evening on such a wonderful night. <clears throat> um, thanks for taking the time to join us. So, yeah, I'm going to speak for just a couple minutes here on stress incontinence. So, 
you know, as opposed to what Dr. Slopnik mentioned, which is really overactive bladder or urge incontinence, stress incontinence is, is really perhaps better termed exertional incontinence. I think stress incontinence, people think, well, I'm all stressed out, so I leak. Well, not quite. This is something where anything that raises pressure in the, in the abdomen that uh, could be a cough, a sneeze, a laugh, a jump, that then can cause leakage. So that's really an anatomical function. If the neck of the bladder really just can't hold things back, you know, and leakage occurs. So that's, again, the typical scenario you will see someone leaks when they're running and coughing and jumping and laughing. So that's in distinction to what Dr. Slopnik just covered, which is really when they get the urge to go and can't get there in time and urgency and frequency. Now, sometimes people have a little bit of both. We call that mixed incontinence. So then it's our job together with all of you to help, you know, separate out, you know, which best way uh, to, to approach the problem because the treatments are somewhat opposite to one another. There is a little bit of an overlap, and, and that's really this uh, top left picture that's shown with the, uh, you know, exercises, and as Dr. Slopkin mentioned, the pelvic floor exercises or Kegel exercises do have some activity for stress incontinence. You got to do them, and you got to keep doing them for them to work. So if you get if you've got an interest in this, as she mentioned, you know, physical therapy, pelvic floor physical therapists that we have within our system are very helpful for us. But you got to keep doing the exercises, and this goes for any type of physical therapy. Uh, be it for your knee, your back, or your pelvic floor. Um, one of the other options is the bottom left, and that's something called a pessary or an incontinence pessary. Um, it's basically a device that's placed inside the vagina to kind of help prop things up. So that when someone does do that activity and pushing and coughing and laughing, well, those are a little bit, you know, uh, spontaneous. So it's hard to really predict that. But if someone said they just notice leakage when they're at you know, cardio kickboxing, or they're doing something very physically active, then they may put an insert like that in throughout the day or when they're at that activity and then take it out later on down the line. Uh, or they keep it in during the day and they take it out at bedtime. So that's probably what a lot of people do too. Um, there isn't a commercially uh, available over-the-counter version called Impressa. And for those of you who do Amazon ordering, you can order it on Amazon too. And, and it's another way that you can use to, uh, to try something as a non-reusable. So this is a disposable insert that goes in and out uh, every day. A new one has to go in. Um, otherwise, we start to use uh, different options, one of which is to try to, in almost in simple terms, um, you know, plug up the hole a little bit. In other words, uh, add some resistance, kind of like putty is put around a washer or faucet, and that's something called an injectable. So these injectables are done in the office. So someone would come into the office, we put some numbing gel in the, in the area where someone urinates through, and then look in with a special telescope and then you know, inject a material that'll help essentially seal up the valve. In that case, they'll be less likely to leak when they're more physically active and coughing, et cetera. And then obviously still you know, allow them to urinate like normal. Um, sometimes those injections need to be repeated at some point in time, but many people will get improvement with just one. And that's what the picture on the left has shown. And then the picture on the right shows the last option we do, which is something called a sling. A sling, kind of like the name implies, is something like a, like a swing set, really, that helps support the urethra where you pee through. And so most of these are done as outpatient surgeries. So these are in and out surgeries. We all do them at our various facilities throughout the city and throughout Northeast Ohio. <clears throat> and so these are, someone comes in the operating room, a small incision in the vagina, placed typically one form or another of a, of a tape to help support the urethra. When they push and cough then, they'll be less apt to leak. Uh, and again, we, we basically, it's an in and out surgery, come and go the same day. Minimal downtime, I think, for most types of slings that we do. Uh, patients can get back to most normal activities within one to two weeks. Uh, and usually just with a small handful of days off, if, if that, depending on their level of, uh, of comfort. Uh, next slide. And then I'm going to leave it to Dr. Bologna now to speak on prolapse. Sandra, if I can just jump in for one yeah. second, just one other thing I want to mention, which is not a standard treatment, but for those who are interested and potentially eligible, we are also part of a trial where we use a patient's own muscle cells uh, to treat their stress incontinence. And that involves taking a small biopsy from their thigh muscle, just under local, and then growing up the stem cells and then injecting those into the urethra to sort of reawaken and uh, re-strengthen their sphincter muscle. Now, there are a lot of specific uh, 
physical exam type things that one needs in order to get into that study, but that's just something if anyone who has stress incontinence was interested in a study like this, and that's just something else that we can offer. Thanks. And I might just before Dr. Bologna takes over, just mention one thing as I, as I alluded to two types of incontinence that many people have both, we call it mixed incontinence. And, and as I suggested, you know, several of us have to help separate out which type is more dominant. And, and I think that's an important distinction because if you treat overactive bladder and the patient's real problem is stress incontinence, it's not gonna help much or vice versa. So I think it's an important distinction that um, if a patient comes in helping us, you know, with the history, that that's a big difference. And then just the same, you know, there's physical exam uh, aspects to it and things like that that'll help us differentiate best uh, which way to approach things to help you the best. Thank you, Dr. Basavada. Um, that's a good lead way into prolapse because one of the more common things that we see is that women who have prolapse, something is dropping down, they're feeling a bulge they'll often have bladder symptoms, or that may be the driving symptom that brings them to their physician or their primary care doc uh, to be evaluated to try to understand what is wrong. Uh, so prolapse can happen in many different ways. In the upper left-hand corner is more normal anatomy, where the easiest thing for you to recognize is probably the pubic bone towards the front, then the bladder, then the uterus, and then the vaginal opening. And when we think about prolapse, it's pretty interesting because a lot of women will all of a sudden realize that they feel a bulge, something doesn't feel right, they'll have some pelvic pressure or discomfort. And even for some women, they may go to the emergency room because they're afraid of what they're feeling, or they think they have a mass or a tumor. Um, so really, on a good exam, we can figure out what is happening and where the prolapse has developed. Um, majority of time, we don't have to do any x-rays, there's no imaging to do. It's just a pelvic exam in the office and we can figure out what is happening. Uh, it's very difficult for a woman herself to try to understand because kind of a bulge is a bulge. You just feel something that feels different. So the things that can happen, the bladder can drop down and push on the vaginal wall. And so you can feel that bladder pushing down like in the upper right hand picture. And really when that happens, you may not be able to empty your bladder as well. It can kink off the tube you urinate through making it more difficult to empty. And what becomes even a little bit more difficult to discern is that as that bladder drops down and kinks off the tube you urinate through, you may end up not having leakage anymore. So you talk to some patients who were having leakage and all of a sudden it went away and they had a bulge. And like Dr. Vasavita said, that's where it really comes our job to try to determine what's happening. Do you still have that component of stress incontinence, but your bladder dropping down is protecting you? And so we often all try in the office to duplicate when your bladder was back up to try to see if you're gonna leak or not when we're thinking about corrections. The other thing that can happen in the bottom left-hand corner, the rectum can push up in vaginally. When, when that happens, the most common symptom that a woman will feel is that the stool will come down, but it'll get stuck and it won't wanna come out. And women are often surprised in the office, we'll look at them and say, well, do you have to push in vaginally to have a bowel movement? And they'll be like, well, how do you know that? And that's something that we hear commonly all day long. And when you ask somebody, um, they have to push to kind of splint as we call it, or to straighten things out so that they can actually have a complete bowel movement. But the other thing that can happen in the bottom right-hand corner is that the uterus can drop down and that can give you pressure and discomfort. And that's, an, that's interesting because a lot of times when you wake up first thing in the morning, the uterus is up, you don't have any symptoms. But the more you're on your feet, walking around all day, lifting at work, all of a sudden towards the end of the day, you start feeling more pelvic pressure and discomfort. It's not uncommon for us to examine a woman early in the morning and her pro prolapse may not be present. And sometimes we'll bring her back in later in the afternoon to examine her on a different day. Um, or I always tell my patients, don't be surprised, we may examine you lying down. And then we also may examine you standing up in the office to try to determine what your prolapse is. If you've already had a hysterectomy and your uterus is out, you can still develop vaginal prolapse. And so it can be a bulge from the middle of things just like uterine prolapse, but now it's the vaginal supports have come down. So we look at it kind of the top, middle and bottom. And on the top side of things, bladder can drop down in vaginally. On the bottom side of things, the rectum can push up 
into the vaginal area. And then in the middle, the uterus can drop down, or if you've had a hysterectomy, the top of the vaginal area can drop down. Can you go to the next slide, please? So like everything you've heard this evening, it's kind of a, a, a theme of three things you can always do. And with prolapse particularly, it's really a matter of how much it's bothering somebody. There's very few indications that you have to do something. Um, so it depends. Some people are very tolerant of, of the prolapse and it's not really bothering them. And other folks, just a small amount of prolapse concerns them and they want to get it corrected. So like all the therapies we talked about tonight or all the problems, the therapies are similar. You can do something very conservative. You can do pelvic floor therapy, uh, work with our physical therapists so they can make sure that you're doing things correctly. We have numerous pessaries in all shapes and sizes. And you can try one of those to give you support. And on the right picture on the top, you can kind of see how a pessary sits in vaginally and holds up the bladder and can hold up the uterus. And then finally, if somebody has tried conservative methods or they just want to move on to surgery, uh, the majority of the surgeries that we do are all outpatient. Uh, we do much of our work vaginally or we do it robotically. Uh, often we'll do a combination of, of robotics and vaginal because certain things you can only do from certain directions. Um, majority of it is outpatient. Recovery is fairly minimal. Uh, it's usually six weeks, no heavy lifting, pushing, pulling, but we really can get people back to work as fast as they, as fast as they feel comfortable as long as they don't have to lift. Usually I tell folks that walking is fine, stairs are fine, showering is fine, driving is fine when they're comfortable. It's just no heavy lifting, pushing, pulling. So I think there's a lot of great options. I think uh, things have become more and more minimally invasive and really get folks back on their feet right away. So I think we're gonna turn it back over to Sarah and try to sort out if we have any questions. Okay. All right, so if you guys have any questions, just place it in the chat and then um, we can go through them. We do have one question um, that was actually asked before the conference started. And um, that was, are there any successful non-surgical treatments for bladder prolapse? And if so, what are they? Is pelvic, we'll start off with that one. Dr. Bologna, do you wanna talk about that? I know you just kind of mentioned it, but just wanna reiterate it. Yeah, I think, you know, pelvic floor therapy can certainly make a difference. We always tell folks that it's probably not going to make things perfect again, but the whole goal is that you're not having symptoms from it. Uh, so if you can get enough support by, by retraining your pelvic floor and strengthening your pelvic floor, then that's certainly a success. And then the use of pessaries is another option also. Okay. And just, can to, we... just to reiterate that, and then I did see Carly's question. Um, I think Pelvic floor physical therapy is an option. It is something that you can try conservatively. It may not change the level of the bulge or how far it's coming down, but if you're not bothered by the bulge and it's more feeling some heaviness or feeling some weakness that bothers you, then strengthening the pelvic floor may help with that. Um, the pessary is something else to try. I think of a pessary like a really good bra. It holds everything up. Um, but it shouldn't be uncomfortable and it's just kind of there and, you know, like a good bra, sometimes during the day, you're like, oh yeah, I have that bra on today, but it's not something that's painful or uncomfortable. So those are both things that are reasonable to try. It's also reasonable to go ahead and do surgery if you're bothered and you don't want to do the physical therapy or try the pessary. And then in terms of doing surgery, can the prolapse come back? Yes, it can. Um, these any type of treatment or surgery that we choose or that you choose after our, our discussions um, are meant to be as durable and long lasting as possible. Um, we do some surgeries that use your natural tissues that can continue to stretch over time. Um, and sometimes we use mesh, which can be more durable and long lasting, but you still can have different types of prolapse that come back over time. Um, after surgery, they're probably, depending on the type of surgery we do, between a one and a 20% chance that you may wanna have surgery again for the prolapse down the road or try one of these other treatments. 
So I think Dr. Slotman brings up a really good point about the progression through ther therapies and do you have to do something conservative before you can do surgery? Certainly for prolapse and stress incontinence, you Hi. can go whichever direction you want to go. There is no progression that's required. Some people want to go straight to surgery. Some people want to try everything conservative first. For overactive bladder, we tend to have to use our medications, at least one or two medications before many of the insurance companies will let us progress on. Um, so that's the one, one little hiccup we run into. And I do like that broad description. I've never used that. I'm wondering, I, I don't know if I'm going to be comfortable using that or not, but I like it a lot. So I may, I may borrow right. that. Ray, if I, I were you, I, I, Ray, if I were you, I would not use that. <laughs> I'm glad that the question came up because I, that's one of my favorite analogies and I wanted to be able to use it. <laughs> we won't steal your thunder then. And related to prolapse, another question is how far can a prolapse bladder actually drop? That's a good question. Uh, we've seen them out pretty far. They never fall out. I think that's the one thing to remember. And you're not actually you're not actually seeing your bladder. You're seeing vaginal lining push down. Uh, but I think all of all of us have seen them come out at least uh, tennis ball size. I would say is that a safe description? I think sometimes they can look like a head of a baby coming out. It could be pretty significant, almost like a cantaloupe. Yeah, I think the interesting thing there is when we start seeing them that large, it's typically more than just bladder. It's a loss of vaginal support uh, overall at that point, too. And remember, these are these are hernias. So a lot of times, um, you know, people understand the fact that hernias and, and men tend to go in a different location in the lower be belly, whereas in women, very, very common, you know, for a herniation of the bladder into the vagina, herniation of the rectum, small bowel, uterus. And like Dr. Bologna just mentioned, oftentimes there's more than one component. And so that's where, you know, we have to help uh, you know, discern which one is going on and which one needs to be repaired should one go on to, to surgery. Uh, another question is, is mesh, mesh safe for uh, the treatment of stress incontinence? So, so I'll, I'll take that, um, you know, so, so as you can imagine, uh, there's been a lot of controversy on the use of materials for uh, the treatment of stress incontinence, and and that probably frames that question. So several years ago, almost 10 years ago, the, the FDA had some statements that really kind of questioned the use of mesh in the vagina. More recently, they've really come back as far as the slings go, and, and this is what you're referring to for stress incontinence, is a, is a, is a really small strip to help support the urethra, that it's perhaps you know still very safe and effective, uh, but it's something you should always discuss with your with your practitioner. Um, you know, all of our parent societies, uh, our American Urology Society, our SUPU, which is our female urology society, and, and many others around the world have all really strongly advocated for the use of, of the mesh tape uh, because it's probably the single best thing we've ever done for urinary incontinence, bar none, based on the way it's been studied, the number of studies, the number of patients accrued, how they've been followed, um, so, so really, it's it's to us, and we use all of, all of us use it quite routinely. Uh, but it's as you can imagine, an active discussion. Pa patients have to be comfortable with that, and and make sure that they don't want to choose uh, other alternatives, which could include using your own tissue. And and your own tissue, we typically use would be something called fascia, and so it's sort of a tough white layer that keeps all of our insides in. And so at times, you know, we do selectively use that, no question. Um, but I think the majority of us will more often perform the synthetic slings than, than the other fascia slings uh, on a routine basis. Anyone else want to add to that? I, I, this is Howard Goldman. I would just completely agree. I think if you look at the data, the synthetic slings have been the most and best studied of any incontinence procedure. There are probably the greatest number of studies looking at that. Um, again, as with anything, there can be complications, uh, but by and large, it's probably the most effective treatment we've ever had and in the big picture amongst the safest. Thank you guys. Is there any other questions that anybody has? If they do, they can write it in the chat.
If I, would encourage, I would encourage anybody if you do have um, any of suffer from any of the conditions that we discussed. It's very easy as you heard at the beginning when Dr. Martin said our locations. From the west side to the south to the east to the center of town. Uh, we pretty much have things covered and the number that you see there Monday through Friday from 8 to 5 will get you directly with the people who schedule for urology uh, on occasion if they're really busy you may get a voicemail but if you leave a, a message you will get called within 24 hours to schedule also i'm sure many of you do have several questions about individual things or related to yourself and clearly we we covered a lot and these are complex issues and complex treatments and and we really do individualize the options to each person's complaint and each person's exam and concerns. Um, and so we would be happy to happy to talk with you further and, and answer all of your questions um, in the office. And because we want we want all of you to understand anything we would do, we want you to have a good understanding and feel good about what you've chosen and we've kind of talked about together for yourself or for your family member. Okay. All right. Sarah, I'll thank you I'll everybody you for joining. Okay. Um, like you said, um, this is the number that you can call uh, to schedule any kind of appointment. Um, if you have any further questions, um, just call that number two and um, they can answer them for you. I hope this was good for everybody. Have a great night.